she did a fabulous job. I thought everybody here did a fabulous job. See, so things can go on without. Just kidding. I had a fun time. Uh, Roy and I had a great time there. They were um, a fun group of people to speak uh, to uh, and be with, and we had a great lunch and then did a concert afterwards. That was fun. So we'll probably do that switcheroo thing one more time later. They're in the process of uh, putting an offer on a, their own building. So all of that's very exciting. A couple things from Anna. She forgot, maybe she didn't, but she told me she forgot to thank everyone who did everything for her. <laughs> so she was grateful for that and for the lunch. And she also would like us all to keep positive um, prayer thoughts and messages about their new home and a new building that they are looking to purchase. Coming up on Wednesday, May 15th, our regular Wednesday night service that night is usually even song, but we have something special. We have a Taizé service planned, a one hour Taizé service with Reverend Erica Saiti. And she is a, a new minister. She lives in Montrose, a minister of religious science. She lives in Montrose and contacted me asking if she could serve our center by uh, leading a Taizé service for us. And I thought that would be wonderful. And so we decided to do that on the Wednesday night of Evensong. So that's the third Wednesday, May 15th, and it's a love offering. Um, and a Taizé service is a candlelight service with um, quite a bit of music and um, messages offered. So if you've been to our Taizé service at uh, Christmas Eve, I can't really say if it's going to be like that or not because I have not seen. She's putting on the whole service, and David and I will help her, uh, but she'll be leading the music and such. Uh, so please come to that. It's a love offering. What is that? Wednesday, May 15th at 7 p.m. So it's like a regular Wednesday night service time. So that's a week and a half from now. Um, and also coming up in May is our first date night. And so that's happening on May 31st. That's the last Friday in May, a Friday at 7 p.m. where we set up outside under our tree out there uh, a concert setting and homemade ice cream. Are you up on that, Nancy? <laughs> yeah, look at her. So thank you very much. We offer homemade ice cream and a concert. The concert starting uh, it will be Solar Brothers Band, which is Roy Martin and Paul Frazier, and they're letting me sing with them too. So they had to add that word band. <laughs> so that will be really fun. Uh, everyone's invited again. That is a love offering, uh, and then we split that love offering with the band and the the center. So that's working out great, and we'll have more of those coming up. We'll get a uh, schedule of that out to you soon. I think that's it. Okay. All right. So 
Let's speak our purpose statement together now in that <clears throat> mindset of oneness, that mindset of only God, God only. All there is is God, omnipresence, omniscience, omnipotence. Here we go. As an intentional spiritual community, the purpose of CSL is to be a living environment for individuals to realize that we are all unique emanations of God, the love intelligence governing the universe. We embody the truth of our oneness with God, and we consciously practice this truth in our everyday life. Through the exploration of new thought, ageless wisdom, and the energy of unconditioned love, we are dedicated to individual transformation and to being a beneficial presence in the world.
and in this holy place. I recognize and feel the sacred power and presence that I call by many names, God, Spirit, Life Essence, Oneness, the allness of life, the presence that is everywhere present, the creator of all, and the creation from itself. Life in all of its manifestations. It is the thought, it is the form, it is the allness of everything. And as this is the allness of everything, I am a part of this expression, a part of this living experience, this living spirit, its power and its presence. Those divine qualities are present in me. And as I know and feel this for myself, I know this is true for each and every one of us, that it is the essence of all people everywhere, especially each of us here today. For we are the fullness of spirit in living form. And it's from this place of sacredness that I affirm that we are living and manifesting those spiritual qualities of unconditional love, joy, prosperity, wisdom, freedom, health, peace, and harmony in our lives right now and the lives around us. <clears throat> We bring forth the best that is within us to share with each other and to live as the beings that we are. We release any ideas of separation from the divine. And as we do so, all that is not of the divine falls away. The questions that we have we let go, for in that all wisdom of the divine are all the answers. And we tune into this wisdom, knowing that this indwelling wisdom sees the questions and the answers come forth with divine wisdom, with guidance, uplifting, guiding and directing us into our highest and best. I affirm that we take great comfort in knowing this sacred presence is greater than our human condition as we look to and we are receptive to all of its gifts. Each request in the prayer chest is in this sacred presence. Unconditional love is renewing and restoring each request to the fullness of life and abundance of blessings are rained upon them and all is well. The service is blessed as we are blessed by the service of the staff, the volunteers, the music, the message. For all of this uplifts our consciousness to a greater awareness of our divine nature. So it's with great thanksgiving and gratitude for experiencing the divine divinity of our beingness and the world around us for knowing that we are connected at all times to this divine oneness. I release these words into the oneness of into the law, knowing it is already fulfilled as we join together and declare. And so it is.
Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to call your attention to the prayer chest at the bottom of the stairs against the wall to the left. If for some reason some of that divine qualities feel like they're eluding you in your life, please leave your concerns in the prayer chest and the practitioner will be knowing the truth of your being this week. There is no problem, no seemingly confused situation to which the answer is not already known to the divine mind. In truth, then, there is no problem. Jack and Cornelia Addington. The answer to every problem already exists in the mind of God, and you are in the mind of God, and the mind of God is flowing through you this minute. Ernest Holmes. Isn't that good to know? <laughs> Yikes. Thank you, Lou. Beautiful. Okay, we're in a new month. May. Mother's Day month. Right? Um, so we have a new theme, and I have chosen this theme, I just couldn't get away from it. I kept thinking, oh, what is it going to be? What is it going to be? And I just kept reading this book, these books, and I'm like, mm, okay, this is what it's going to be. And the theme is letting the divine take the lead. Anyone interested in letting the divine take the lead? Yeah. Um, so the book I'm basing, actually, there's a couple of books. The author is Tasha Silver. Um, some of you may have read some of her stuff. Um, one of the books is called Outrageous Openness. This was written in 2014. And the other book that I keep pulling from is a money book. It's called It's Not Your Money. And so I'm going between these two books, sharing some of her, her stuff with you. Um, one of the reasons I was drawn to this author in particular um, because what does it sound like when she says, letting the divine take the lead? It sounds like we need to maybe surrender, let go. Um, and so surrendering and letting go, those are like feminine qualities of the divine feminine. And so I'm, I'm offering this in the month of May because we're, I think we should celebrate all month. Mother's Day and the Divine Feminine. And um, so we're gonna kind of do that with her writings. Not that she, not that it's not for the masculine or the men, because we are all the, the feminine and the masculine both together. And so, but she's just coming from um, a perspective of mostly uh, surrendering and letting go and knowing, just like uh, Lou's quotes this morning, that we are that indeed are in the mind of God. The mind of God is in us, and we can let go, we can relax, we can get into the flow and let the divine take the lead. So I'm going to read a little bit today, uh, here and there, out of her book. So I'm going to start with the back flap of this. Tasha Silver grew up thinking one day she would be a rabbi, 
a lawyer, or a weather girl. <laughs> but Faith had other ideas. She graduated from Yale with a degree in English literature, but along the way fell madly in love with metaphysics and yogic philosophy. For the past 30 years, she has taught many ways to align with the inner divine. Um, and then from the front cover, so let's see, I wanted to say something about, she graduated with a degree in English literature and it sure shows in her writing. Uh, she's a beautiful, uh, colorful writer. I really enjoy her language. So from the front flat here, it says, what if the divine is constantly igniting roadside flares to get our attention? What if there actually is a supreme organizing principle with an unbridled sense of humor? And what if we each have this ardent inner suitor who's writing us love letters every day that often go unopened? <laughs> so at its heart, Outrageous Oneness, which is the name of this book, opens the door to a profound truth. By allowing the divine to lead the way, we can finally put down the heavy load of hopes, fears, and opinions about how things should be. We learn how to be guided, to take the right actions at the right time, and to enjoy the spectacular show that is our life. How does that sound? Yeah? Okay, good, good. Um, so this book is full of interesting and humorous stories, and they're just like uh, two or three page stories. So it's not really it written like a how-to book, this is what you do. Um, she more writes colorful stories illustrating um, maybe some principles that she uses. This book, a little different. It's a little bit more a how-to book. Um, so one of the other reason I wanted to choose this book is because she is quite humorous and writes in a way that just like lightens up the subject. And we had some heavy stuff uh, last month with Jack Addington that was awesome. Really good mind stuff. And this month, we're going to get more into some lighthearted heart things, okay? Um, let's see. So you can go ahead and put this slide up here. So I want to talk about these. So today in particular, I want to cover these four points that she says these are the basic ideas that run consistently through her work. And she explains them in her books, and I thought that would be a good place to start because she'll be, in her stories, she'll be talking a lot about these four points. And so I'd like to go through those today. I'll say what the points are, what the ideas are, which you can see here, and then I will support them with her words and um, possibly one of her stories as well. So she talks about these four basic ideas. Divine source doership, I practice this next word so much, you guys. <laughs> Pravrabda. Pravrabda. Pra Pravrabda. Karma. Okay, I've got it all spelled out here exactly how to say it. But it doesn't just roll off my tongue. Just saying. So I might just call it karma from now on. <clears throat> and offering. Okay, so let's start with Divine Source. And I've got two books I'm reading out of, so hopefully I won't get all messed up. I think I'm real organized here. <laughs> Divine Source. Well, I guess I'm not that organized. Okay, page 18. Divine Source. Relaxing into Divine Source. She says, Divine Source is the idea that no person, place, or thing is your salvation, only love itself. You begin to trust the universal storehouse that is the foundation of all. You sense the one that underlies the illusion of multiplicity in this world. If you think of the divine as your ultimate protection, 
the source of your work, finances, and all needs, then even the economy becomes irrelevant. You lift your vibration above the turbulence of the current economic reality into the capable hands of that from which all things come. Then the universe can use anything it wishes to meet your needs sometimes in ways far more creative and unexpected than the mind can fathom. When my friend Andy says he envies people with inheritances, I often laugh. Well, divine source actually is the ultimate trust fund <laughs> in more ways than one. And so sprinkled throughout her books, she has small prayers. And she actually has a whole nother book called Change Me Prayers. And I really, I really like them. I like going back and forth between these, these awesome, powerful Jack Addington and Ernest Holmes prayers where we claim our good and we know this one divine source. And then I love coming to her prayers where she's a little more playful. God is her constant companion who she checks with about everything. Okay, so she's got a little prayer here. When I, when I say these prayers, just close your eyes here. She says, so this is a good way to, um, to rest in the awareness of the divine source, okay? She says, change me, divine beloved, into one who fully trusts that all true needs are always met through your bounty. Let me surrender and allow you to be my source for all. Let me breathe, relax, and let you lead. I am safe, I am peaceful. All needs will abundantly be met. I am yours completely. How does that feel? Yeah, so, so I'm going to be using those prayers sprinkled throughout uh, this month and <laughs> I actually have a handout of the prayers that I'm using today, and uh, it's kind of funny because there's a typo in the handout, and I I'm not even going to tell you what it is. You'll find it. <laughs> That's going to get you to get one. The word's supposed to be offer, okay? <laughs> All right. Um, let's see where I am. Okay. So, divine source. I'm moving on now to doership. Okay. I was supposed to keep this book open. It said, keep open. <laughs> it right here, keep open. <laughs> Doership. Eventually, in some life or another, chasing and grasping begin to constrict like outgrown clothes. The soul longs for something larger than the ego's agenda to guide the way. You long to serve and harmonize with the Tao. <clears throat> Many times this shift comes purely from exhaustion. A friend of mine once told me, you know, I was a hard nut to crack, but I'm finally letting go. Who knows whether it's evolution or exhaustion, but I am. When that time dawns, no matter what suffering is the spur, it is a blessed moment. You are finally being broken open by God. Releasing doership means that rather than striving and pushing harder, you actually learn to get out of your way. Your instincts start to guide your actions and you don't cling to the outcomes. So here's a little story in, in this book about doership. She says, I'm often thinking about the topic of doership and who, in fact, is the one doing the doing. Life changes radically if you know you're a conduit for what wishes to happen, as opposed to the one making it all occur. Then you can inwardly say, <coughs> use me. Whatever I have to give for the highest good, just let me be helpful and contribute my all. Over the years, I've watched as that simple prayer has brought people whole new callings and destinies. 
Once the focus moves from getting and doing toward being a vessel, then everything changes. She says, I heard a story once about a spiritual teacher from France who was a charismatic speaker with the uncanny ability to connect people to the truth of their own hearts. In the beginning, she was deeply grateful to help. As years went by, lecturing around the world, she received much praise and renown. She was treated with tremendous deference and respect, hearing constantly how talented she was. Then one day, she was about to speak in Australia at a huge convention. The conference center was packed. The crowd buzzed with excitement. She walked to the microphone and opened her mouth. Nothing came out. Her voice had vanished. She spent the next three months essentially mute. This was no common bout of laryngitis. No doctors or tests could diagnose the problem. Her tour was canceled. Finally, she prayed with desperation to understand, feeling like she was losing her mind, not to mention her livelihood. That night, a vivid dream arrived. So tell me, she heard, who did your voice belong to anyway? In the beginning, you knew. Then, you forgot. Remember the truth, and it will return. So she ended up laying flat on the floor of her bedroom, offering her voice, her teachings, all she had back to the one that had silently, <coughs> patiently owned it all along. And a few weeks later, it did return. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's one of her points about doership. So next, let's go to Pravrada Karma. Pravrada. Will you say it? Come on. <laughs> okay, so I wanted to explain a little bit uh, about this. Uh, and so I, I looked up Yogapedia. <laughs> Isn't that great? So it tells a little bit of, of what this means. It consists of the past actions that are affecting the current life, okay? And you may or not believe in this, and it doesn't matter whether you believe in this or not. This is her take, and this is what she bases her things on, and it's just a new way of looking at things. It's really good to be open at the top, just saying. So um, it consists of the past actions that are affecting the current life. So karma in general refers to all actions in life and the effect that they have on life in the future and future incarnations. This kind of karma cannot be changed because it is the karma created earlier in life or in past lives and it is yielding results in the present moment. So now with that explanation in mind, I think you can more easily understand when she talks about this kind of karma in her book. Um, and remember, she's very, very interested in yogic philosophy, and she refers to it a lot in her writing. She even has a whole thing on Kali. Do you guys remember Kali? Yeah. All right, so let me read you a little bit about this kind of karma that she has. How's everybody doing? You're doing okay? Good. Good, good. All right. One of my favorite spiritual writers had a time when multiple illnesses plagued him. Someone said to me, this guy is a total beam of light. You feel uplifted simply by being in the same room. So how can he, even he have all of these problems? Did you ever think that about spiritual people? I remember when Wayne Dyer died, so many people came to me and like, how could he die? And I'm like, well, you know, everyone's gonna die. <laughs> You know, and so this is a little bit like that. She says, one of the dark legacies of manifestation culture is that many people think, if only we perfect ourselves enough that we gain VIP entry to a secret Disneyland where nothing bad ever occurs. And then they blame themselves when the inevitable changes come that are a part of incarnate existence. Or they harshly judge others when difficulties arrive, assuming they must have done something wrong. Oh, pity she created that. But what's missing here, while the law of attraction is true, so is the law 
of prarabdha karma. I mean, even the great Indian saint Ramakrishna got throat cancer. What matters is how we handle our unique karma, our own soul's course of study. When embraced, it becomes the royal road to true abundance. So that little portion right there is what she thinks about this kind of karma. It is our own soul's course of study, that each person has their own individual path that they are walking through uh, their spiritual journey. And each person has their own course. And your course is not my course. So some things maybe aren't meant to be for the course that you're on. So this is uh, another little story about this kind of karma. Did you ever hear about the actor Jim Carrey who wrote himself a check for $10 million from the Universal Bank long before he was famous? Who knows that story? Yeah. It spawned a parade of similar check writers all over the planet. Unfortunately, however, many came to believe their own gazillions didn't arrive Fed Express because they blocked it. Yet, I'd say it happened for Jim simply because that was his karma. This book comes from a singular premise. Everybody has a different set of lessons they're learning in any given lifetime. It may not be your own destiny to have $10 million. That might actually be the last thing your soul needs. You might be learning this life to trust you'll always have enough. And the more you open to divine source, the more you will. Some issues are so fundamental to your soul's awakening that we come back lifetime after lifetime to resolve them. Someone who accrues great wealth may be working out a certain karma, perhaps to see if they will be generous, grateful, good-hearted. If they're not, they may well create a different karma in future lives. The law of attraction and the law of karma intertwine in every moment. The more you come to trust this source, the less you'll need vast wealth to feel abundant. I'm going to say that one more time. The more you come to trust divine source, the less you'll need vast wealth to feel abundant. If it comes, then fantastic, and perhaps you'll be generous with it. But you start to feel prosperous no matter what your personal karma when you trust in divine source. All right. So next we're moving on to offering. Um, let's see. Offering. Offering is the heart of this book. It's handing any burden, whether a desire, attachment, illness, finance, or anything, back to God. I better read that again. Whether a desire, attachment, illness, finances, or anything, back to God. After all, it was hers to begin with. In a way, doing so says, this is persecuting me so much I can no longer lean on my ego's own strength. Please, show me your will. True offering takes what can be an unbearable cross and returns it to love. It untangles you from the seemingly inescapable thicket of doership. One easy way to begin is simply by replacing my with the. We're taught to think of my money, my body, my partner, my happiness, my failure, even my awakening. In Western culture, the trance of my is king. But here's the catch. If it all belongs to you, the ego, then the burden is all yours as well. With the simple substitution of the, then the grasping softens and the offering begins. Take, for example, I'm worried right now about this business. This can be applied to anything. Sally had built an entire agonizing identity centered around her terrible rheumatoid arthritis, which is so easy to do, we all know. 
She was always saying, my illness, my restrictions, my expenses, all this with increasing anger and desperation. So I suggested that since she had nothing to lose, she could offer the entire mess to the divine and release the my. She began to say, I give this illness fully to you. Please, please make me open and show me the right actions. And if there's not currently a solution, please at least let me accept this for now and make clear what I need to learn. So she immediately felt more spacious simply from dropping that my. And over time, the process of offering acceptance and disentanglement brought healing she never imagined. She felt guided to return to an acupuncturist she'd seen many years before who had used treatments, herbs, and diet. However, this time, it all worked. Perhaps because she finally released the grip of her ego's identification with the problem. I remember uh, using something similar like that just not that long ago. Um, instead, of my, or instead of the, um, I used God's. And it was when I was taking care of my daughter, remember that? Mm -hmm. She was pregnant and I was taking care of her. And, you know, that wasn't easy work. I had to leave my own home and go to her home and take care of her whole home, her children, her dogs, her everything. And I remember a lot of times I had to, to, to speak out loud to myself. Um, uh, I am changing God's baby's diaper. I am feeding God's dogs. Um, boy, that really helped me to get through that. When I, because when you're doing and it's God's dogs, man, you know, that was more sacred than just, you know, my daughter's dogs or something. So this is a really good practice, either saying the, or you could say God's, either one of those, or whatever you come up with. All right, let's see, where are we? Oh, so, um, let's see. One more thing about offering here, because offering she talks about a lot. When we read her stories later, she'll be talking about offering. The act of offering is a holy process. Anything truly surrendered is indeed made sacred. You're not just throwing some mess at God saying, hey, I hope you can handle it, dude, because I sure can. You're, not long, you're no longer demanding, how fast can I get my order delivered? Instead, you're softening and wondering, what am I learning here? How can I be kinder to myself right now? You take that unbearable burden and say, I can no longer be an ego lugging this around like a pack mule. Please show me the way. And often you find that the problem that, 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 that's been your biggest nemesis is actually the key to your freedom. You end up in the present, trusting there will be enough. You're not obsessed about what you must manifest next or how great life will be later. You're not fixated on past regrets or fantasy future. You're smack in the present, accepting the now and open to love. No matter where you are, offering brings you back where you belong, right into God's lap. You say, may this burden that's brought me such suffering become the road to you. And it will be. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. So uh, in the back of her book, she has questions and answers. And one of the questions is, what is the simplest way to begin this process of offering to the divine? And so she goes over that in one of these chapters in this book. And I'm going to share this with you. Think inside the box, she calls it. One of the first techniques I learned was the God box. Who knows about a God box? Mm -hmm. You simply write down your worries and pop them into some kind of container, as simple or elegant as you wish. 
whenever a new worry comes up, into the box it goes. You don't even need a clear concept of God to do this. You could make the offering to your own highest wisdom or to the force that keeps the birds aloft in the sky. Doesn't matter. Sounds simplistic, but honestly it works. If the problem torments you again, you remember, it's in the box, it's done. Because studies show that the mind recalibrates in 21 days, she says try to reliably submit a particular worry for at least that long. During the period of offering, solutions offer spontaneously. Solutions often spontaneously arise. When the mind is no longer grasping for an answer, then space opens. The box gives room for a divine plan, even in impossible messes. What matters is offering the problem over with a sincere and a consistent heart. So to sum all this up, she says, when the agendas and the shopping lists of the ego, of the ego are released, then there is room created for a divine plan that is far beyond our man manipulations of the mind. She says, to me, this is what creates true happiness and awakening. Then existence becomes a daily surprise as it unfolds, and we can literally be used by love as a force for good. Life happens through us and for us rather than by us. It is actually a very, very powerful way to live, and it is available to anyone with practice. So I told you about the, the handout over there on the table, and I'm going to share one last little prayer with her, and then we'll have a song. So just relax a moment, maybe close your eyes for just a little bit here. It's very short. Open me, divine, to what I need to know right now. Allow me to open to the changes that I might make in my life. I am here for you. You take the lead now. In gratitude, I offer you my life. And it is so. Mm -hmm. to God in gratitude and I find the most easy to me the same to me the same I bow to God in great happiness and I learn from where the sons all follow their ways follow their to the friend in deep reverence and discover love and secret carried in the air carried in the air this whole universe is just as blessed
of the universe. I put my trust as I let go, knowing that it circulates. 
blessing our community, our world, and our church, and especially ourselves. And so I give freely from that which is freely given. And our affirmation? Miraculously, amazingly, everything I need always comes. going for the women's retreat. So if you'd like to go to the women's retreat, please sign that. I need to know what, what's happening there. It uh, The dates are on there, August 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, so that will be two overnights, okay? Uh, so please sign up, and then I'll get back with you uh, how that's going. Um, okay, I think that's it. And we're ready to claim our good, so all this is brand new. I have a new handout over here with all of the new affirmations. Um, and the new claiming our good uh, as well, if you'd like to pick one of those up. I think it says the same thing. Let's see. Here we go, all the way down. God is opening me to receive beyond anything I imagine. May I know my own value, beauty, and worthiness without question, so I may carry your life without restriction. Thank you, Divine, and so it is. I'm in the right place at the right time. I'm just where I'm supposed to be. I'm in the right place at the right time. I'm just where I'm supposed to be. I'm in the right place at the right time. I'm just where I'm supposed to be. I'm in the right place at the right time. I'm just where I'm supposed to be. I'm in the right place at the right 